2,000 acres of mud, brown, with all the usual trucks and earth movers, right next to the Austin airport. This is definitely the future in so many ways. It's also the story of the ups and downs, the haves and have nots, and the good and the bad sides of progress in one of the fastest growing cities in the world. This is what we call our pad A, if you will. It's got some zip on it. Yeah. You want to go up? Let's go up. The basic shape of the two buildings now is coming pretty evident. I'm Josh Skernick for My Point TV in Austin, Texas. And with the precision of a flying ace and yet the touch of a Gen Z gamer, this drone pilot has an intimate knowledge of this plot of dirt. Don't let its unassuming facade fool you. This is the site of Tesla's Gigafactory Texas, a massive project encasing the wonderment and rabid devotion shown to the electric car manufacturer. Joe Tegmeyer has watched it since birth. I'm a retired Air Force. I used to be a KC-135 pilot, and flying drones is kind of a, a way of flying again for me, so that's kind of cool. We've discussed with Elon Musk. He says we can be out here. We've worked with the uh, security guys. You've talked with Elon about this? Yeah. Like actually like with, with Elon? Twitter's back and forth. He came back and he said it was perfectly fine. Talk about top-down leadership, right? Pretty impressive. It took only five days after Tesla's unique and aggressive CEO Elon Musk officially broke ground at the end of July for this brand enthusiast to begin making the hour and a half pilgrimage from San Antonio to Austin, all just to document the progress and upload it to the internet. The videos have gone from a few hundred views to now routinely over 10,000 views on each new one. I do these about every other day. It's just incredible how fast it's growing and the interest that, that's coming up. Tesla is uh, coming out with the Cybertruck, which is a brand new product, and this is where it's going to be built. So I figured, let me, let me do this and get, a, get people a chance to see what's going on. Why do you think there's so much interest in Tesla? Um, you know, a lot of times throughout our, our lives, it's very rare that a once in a lifetime thing actually comes where it's 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 very disruptive it's very change it changes the way we do things it changes the way we think about things tesla came along and and you know they had to fight through all of the challenges that go along with starting up a new company and, and getting into the industry all that stuff but they're doing it they're producing something i reached out to tesla media relations and all the contractors for an interview none of them got back to me and tesla security has already said this is about as far as we can go. But even from here, you can see just how much activity is happening on the site. It rained yesterday, and the entire priority for this crew is just getting the water off the ground so they can get back to work and just speaks to the breakneck speed at which they're trying to get this thing done. Not even maybe two weeks ago, all of this stuff that you see, these small little tiny hills in front of us, were actually about 100, 150 feet tall. So you could not see anything. How's the flying today? There's about four of us that do drone videos out here, and we do them at different times during the day. Gigatex. Good early morning from Giga Texas. I tried to get a early morning sunrise for you. Usually about 8, 30, 9 o'clock uh, is when I uh, come out and film. And then another guy comes out about noon, and another guy comes out, say, 4 or 5 in the afternoon. In between my video and that video, major changes have happened. What is that a testament to, do you think? I think uh, part of it is the uh, the whole Tesla's idea of we want to get in, we want to get it built, we want to start producing cars as fast as possible. But to produce cars, Tesla will need people, lots of people. With a promise to bring 5,000 new jobs to Austin, no one will know every posting, every salary range, and every tech worker looking to make the next move than these guys, their headhunters. How's business been? Now, especially with the advent of remote being okay for a lot of companies for the first time ever, we're seeing business just as busy as it's ever been. Right on. Which is exciting. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, last uh, 30 days, 60 days have been really, really hot for us as well. Zach, have you even reached out to Tesla yet on jobs like this? We have. We're actually seeing cybersecurity, mobile, uh, systems engineering, electrical nice. engineering, mechanical engineering, all being advertised. And to, to the point, I think that many of these things may be marketing to drum up applicants. I'm not sure if they're really making those hires just yet. And frankly, I'm using it as a marketing play because it's a, it's a sexy company coming to Austin. It really helps our brand. The fact of the matter is they are building this <laughs> Gigafactory. I mean, we, we yeah. can see it. So what we're learning is that there will be a team uh, of not only assembly line workers, specifically for the high tech manufacturing roles, but it also seems that they will be bringing some uh, tech, software-based, and embedded systems type positions also to Austin. 
in the near future. Cybersecurity is interesting. I mean, that's going to be a large volume of positions. And uh, the talent pool is not here to support it yet, which obviously puts make business great for us. Great indeed with cybersecurity jobs averaging above 100K. But remember, at its heart, this is a place for men and women to build cars, something America was built upon. Is this the advent of blue collar manufacturing jobs in Austin? Let's hope so. I've gotten a little tired of celebrating the elite top 1% technology world of Apple's and Google's coming here. You know, and, and there is... That's a, what keeps you in business though, right? Well, there is, yeah. I don't necessarily hate it, but at the same time, um, it gets old celebrating it. You know, if this documentary was about uh, Amazon's HQ2, I would be uh, all on board with saying, I don't really want it. Uh, and that's maybe the old man in me saying, I want the Austin of the old days, get off my yard. But the reality is I don't want Austin to continue to expand with $150,000 jobs and, and, and the, the, the sprawl. But I think this gives us an opportunity to uh, raise up the, the impoverished and, the, and the, uh, the lower middle classes. There's been a generational loss for employees without college degrees that affects minority communities and recently in the past 35 years, rural whites. A number of our clients have RPA, robotic processing automation positions to automate mundane jobs. Automate them and then take out the benefits. If Tesla is really bringing jobs that pay 20 to 30 bucks an hour with healthcare as well, that would be incredible. Well, back in the 1950s, you get a job at Ford or Chevy and you're able to you know, stay there forever and you've got benefits and it's a great job. Maybe this harkens back to that for Tesla. When you look at the Austin tech landscape, you've got companies like AMD, uh, Tokyo Electron, Cirrus Logic, and many of these are high-tech manufacturing at their core. But what's so interesting is these companies operate here in Austin and not a bit of their manufacturing happens here in Austin or even in Texas or even in the U.S. Considering how progressive Elon is, maybe these other companies will begin to follow suit when they see the excitability factor. Do you know what the starting pay is for an assembly line worker at Tesla? We're seeing it advertised at 35K. That seems kind of low, right? We're talking about a city that's known for white collar, highly educated, six figure a year positions. When we consider the discrepancy between the lower tier income and the higher tier income, I can't think of a city in the United States that has a bigger discrepancy between both ends of the spectrum. So bringing these jobs in at a 35K level even is gonna be really, really attractive to folks that maybe don't have the education. Elon, even in a tweet just months ago, mentioned that he doesn't care what your background is. He doesn't care what your education is. He wants people that are here for the right reasons. He wants people that want a good job. I'm just thinking about the proximity to the town's 25 and 30 miles from here. You know, in California, folks commute 55 miles in two hour commutes. So what's, what is it to come from Smithville? Take that out to our rural communities where they'd have some, some access to that because there's nothing out there. You go out to Giddings, Texas and see what's going on out there, nothing. It's also gonna be a boon to East Austin. It, it, it's, uh, that's an area ripe for development. So I'm really excited about that and bring it, raising up other folks with jobs versus handouts. East Austin. If there is any place that is a symbol of the changing landscape here, it is the area of the city east of I-35. So close to downtown, yet for decades so far from the money and wealth of the tech scene. But as Bay Area workers move here expecting Bay Area salaries, incomes aren't the only things going up as they look for a place to live and are willing to pay handsomely for them. Rising housing costs is a major chapter in the tale of Austin. I'm Joe Bryson. What up? There you go. <laughs> and as the story of Texas's weirdest city unfolded, after 54 years of calling it home, Joe Bryson has lived it. It was cheap to live here. It was, uh, I mean, my first rent, I had a little two-bedroom house, one bath, out on Lake Austin. We rented it for $125 a month. We split the rent $67.50 each. It was very casual. Austin. Well, in s about then was about 250,000 population. Now we're, we've crossed a million in the city. You know, there were no tall buildings. There was the Capitol and the tower. That was it. And as the population grew, Bryson began selling homes, something he has now done for three and a half decades. He saw the housing market crash in the late 80s, expand in the 90s, flounder during 9-11 and the dot bomb, struggle again in the 2008 financial crisis, and then, 
take off like a runaway train. It just hadn't slowed down, and it's, it's just unbelievable to have been on this much of an expansion for 10 years in a row. That's not typical real estate cycles. So through all the ups and downs, you must be pretty happy you stayed in the game. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Fairy tale endings are rare though. Let's go back to the heart of the east side, where Bryson has sold many a home. He will be the first to tell you for every young couple getting their first house and every owner getting the biggest check of their life, there's a struggling neighbor. This neighborhood used to be called the Barrio. You've got like little ethnic type houses over here that you know were left over from the good old days when this was a Latin American neighborhood. We're probably a hundred thousand dollars and they were getting bought up, but then people were starting to build these, these little McMansions that uh, are more like five, six hundred thousand dollars. A half a million dollars or more. Half a million dollars or more. And when you sell those, that makes this land extremely valuable. They can't afford the property taxes anymore, so they end up selling. And people tear them down and build these. Have you ever gotten blowback by the locals in these neighborhoods when you're yeah. trying to sell a home? Yeah, I remember in the early days when this was starting to happen, I was uh, showing a property, oh, probably around 7th Street or something like that. We got out of the car and I saw this, this old black woman sitting on the porch looking at me. and. Uh, we walked in this house and looked around. We came back out and boy, I mean, that woman came off that porch with an umbrella and just came right at us and started beating on my car with the umbrella going, you white boys get out of here. And no joke, no joke. Josh, I wanted to show you an example of what has gone on in this neighborhood. Uh, back in 2013, we were coming out of the credit crunch and I actually sold this little house right here. It wasn't even 700 square feet. And back then those days, they were asking $165,000 for it, which in those days was an unbelievable price. There was actually a bidding war on it. It went for 183,000. These days, this 700 square foot house would sell for about 350, something like that. Almost twice what it did six, seven years ago. And- That's crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. Who was the person who bought it? What kind of person was it? It was a young single woman. She was a, a teacher and it took everything to, uh, you know, for her to buy this house in those days, you know? And uh, I mean, it, and now, now she couldn't afford this house. There's no way. No way, no way. You've got a lot of tech techers, tech people, you know, husband and wife a lot, and they're both pulling down really good salaries. and. So yeah, they're buying this sort of thing and fixing it up and, and they're, you know, you can ride a bike to downtown from here. Old family dynasties are just having to move away, move out of Austin. They, they can't afford to live here. And it's, it's pretty sad to see, you know, the culture of this, of this side, of the east side, just, you know, evaporating right before your eyes. And it's happened in the last 20 years. Big tech coming in. Yeah. There's the good and the bad. Sure. Does the good outweigh the bad? That's a good question. That's a good question. I have to think about that one. Has the east side going down affected me adversely? Probably not. I don't live on the east side, you know, but if I did, I wouldn't be very happy about it. I can tell you that. Do you feel guilty? Mm, kinda, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I've, 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 it's, a, it's affected a, a really great thing and um, yeah I mean I'm a realtor this is my business and all that but yeah it's it's um, not something I'm super proud of <laughs> at Tesla's Gigafactory the march of progress will continue construction of a factory turning into construction within as production of products new and old and even Musk himself moved from California to Texas how long do you plan on doing this, though? Well, um, some of the questions I have is not only what is it going to look like, all the buildings and all that, which is the first product that comes off the line? Nobody knows. You know, is it, are they going to go with the Cybertruck, since that's the big uh, interest item of this particular factory, and have, they have so many reservations for it and there's a lot of interest in it? Will that be the product number one? 
or will they do Model Y, Model 3, which they're already building places, but they already have the tooling and the knowledge and stuff. It might be faster for them to get that going. So which, which is going to be first? His viewers and the rest of the world will be watching. I'm Josh Skernick for MyPoint TV, and that's how I see it.